Hey everybody, thanks for joining us once again. We're going to conclude our study of the book of Habakkuk today. We're going to be looking at Habakkuk chapter 3 verses 1 to 19. We've spent a lot of time uh, panning through uh, this uh, book of prophecy and today we're going to come to Habakkuk's conclusion in the matter. After all of these questions and God's responses, what does Habakkuk walk away with and what do we walk away with? with as as we conclude this study well guys as you're well aware this uh this book uh takes place towards the end of judah's time in the land as the babylonian empire is rising in power and beginning uh to uh to conquer the lands that are around judah uh god has made it clear to habakkuk that babylon is coming for the people of judah and uh, if you're familiar with your biblical history, you know that that's exactly what happens as King Nebuchadnezzar lays siege to Jerusalem uh, and ultimately takes many people from Judah into captivity and back to Babylon. But uh, here in here in Habakkuk, before we get to that, Habakkuk has a series of questions that he asks God. And we've been spending the last couple of weeks looking at some of those questions that we find in chapters 1 and 2 of Habakkuk. At first, in, in early in Habakkuk, he asks, how long must I call on you? In other words, God, where, where are you? You've been quiet for such a long time. And amazingly enough, we see early in Habakkuk, God responds to Habakkuk's question. Uh, and, and the answer to that question is very simple. Where are you, God? I've been here the whole time. I've given you the Mosaic Covenant. I've told you what to do. I'm here waiting for you to obey. Habakkuk's question that goes with that is not only where are you, God, but why are you allowing all this injustice to happen in the land? Uh, Judah was not walking closely with God during the time of Habakkuk. There was uh, Habakkuk himself gives testimony that Judah's heart and the people of Judah's heart were far from God. Uh, and, and Habakkuk wants to know where are you at and why aren't you doing anything with this problem? And God answers Habakkuk by saying, I'm right here and I am bringing, doing something. I'm bringing judgment. In fact, the Babylonians are uh, rising in power right now and they are going to execute my judgment against Judah for their lack of obedience towards me. Well, that answer doesn't sit particularly well with Habakkuk, so he fires into a series of other questions that we find in Habakkuk chapter 1. And the long and short of it is, is Habakkuk's appeal, God, you can't use Babylon. They're even worse than we are. They're going to destroy us. And aren't you already going to judge Babylon? And what we see in Habakkuk chapter 2 is God's response to this series of questions. One, God says, listen, I am the one who does the judging. I'm the one who decides when judgment is due for each people. Judgment is coming for the Babylonians, but not before they judge you. And by the way, Habakkuk, haven't you already told me that Israel and, and Judah are full of injustice? So why is your injustice less righteous than Babylon's injustice? And ultimately, God's response to this is, I am in control. I am the one who judges. I am the one that decides when the time is right for those things. Well, that brings us up to Habakkuk chapter 3. And uh, we're going we're gonna to look at Habakkuk's prayer in chapter 3. So he's had this back and forth with God where he's asked questions about where God is and what he's doing. And God has been incredibly honest and forthright with his answers. So uh, apparently steer, still here at the watchtower, we, we read Habakkuk's response to God's response, this prayer that Habakkuk gives us, uh, which takes up the entirety of chapter 3, and is his response to all this truth that God has given. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Habakkuk chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 1 to 19, and then talking a little bit about Habakkuk's response to God's answer. Here's what God's word says. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, on Sigal. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day and our time. Make them known in wrath. Remember mercy. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise, rays flashed from his hand. 
where his power was hidden. Plague went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed. But he marches on forever. I saw the tents of Cushion in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Were you angry with the rivers, Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode your horses and your chariots to victory? You uncovered your bow. You called your many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by. The deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land with, of wickedness. You stripped him from head to toe. With his own spear you pierced his head, and when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who are in hiding, you trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait on patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nations invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crops fail and the fields produce no fruit, though there is no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of the deer. He enables me to tread on the heights for the director of music on my stringed instruments. Let's pray and we'll look at these passages together. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we thank you for this day and we thank you for the opportunity to look into your word and to consider uh, what it means. Uh, Habakkuk has gone back and forth with you uh, about the things that are happening in, in his day. And Lord, we go back and forth with you on the things that are happening to us. But after talking to you and listening to your word, Habakkuk comes to some important truths and important understandings in his life. As we look at these today, I pray that you would give us guidance and direction, that we could come to important conclusions in our life as well. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, guys, here in Habakkuk chapter 3, uh, verses uh, 1 to 19, we see Habakkuk enters into prayer with God. And, and really, the first, uh, this first section from, from verses 1 to 16, uh, Habakkuk asks God to remember to, to be merciful during his wrath. Uh, Habakkuk comes to the understanding here, and what, and what he's saying here in chapter 3 is, I understand that you are going to bring the Babylons, I, uh, Babylonians. I understand that you are in your right to bring judgment on Judah, but I would ask God that you remain merciful even during this time of wrath. And interestingly enough, what we see is, if you follow on with Old Testament history, this is exactly what God does even in his wrath with Judah. Judah is preserved even through uh, the, the people of Babylon. Uh, one of the things, and we talked about this a little bit earlier in the study, when the Assyrians came and destroyed northern Israel, uh, the Assyrians were incredibly vicious. They were, they were not interested in preserving or, or capturing a culture, and the Babylonians were. Uh, so when, when Nebuchadnezzar comes uh, and he lays siege to Jerusalem at, at the very end of the book of 2 Kings, um, he takes many of the best and the brightest to Babylon with him. Now, when Nebuchadnezzar takes these people, I don't think it's with the intention of returning them to the land, but it was always God's intention for Judah to return to the land. In fact, if you look, at, if you read the uh, the prophecy of Jeremiah. Jeremiah openly tells the people of Judah, listen, go with the Babylonians. You're going to be in captivity for a period of time, 70 years, and then God is going to bring you back. And God 
doesn't work through the Babylonians. He actually accomplishes this through the Persians who conquer the Bab Babylonians. But God tells them even before they go into captivity, before Nebuchadnezzar destroys Israel, that they're going to be in Babylon for 70 years and then they're going to be brought back to the land. So there's a real sense that even though Habakkuk doesn't know the answer to this question, he has God to be merciful. God had already planned for mercifulness even as he was punishing Israel. And in the book of Ezra, chapter 2, verse 1, we read this. This is as the people of Judah are coming back into the land after their 70 years of captivity. He says, now these are the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken to Babylon, they returned to Jerusalem and Judea, each to their own town. What's fascinating about this whole thing is, uh, is Habakkuk's, uh, really his stress about the, in, in this entire prophecy is what's going to happen to the people. And in and, and the great grand scheme of things, the answer is simply this, Habakkuk's view it's not big enough. God had punishment planned for Judah and punishment that they had frankly earned. But at the same time, God was already preparing what was next for them. God had promised David that there would be a king on the throne. God had promised Abraham that he'd always have descendants. And God was fulfilling the promises in the Abrahamic and Davidic covenant, even as he was bringing punishment on Judah. And what he did is he sent this group of exiles into captivity where they became the remnant, the promise that God would always keep descendants of Abraham in this world. They were protected and taken care of in Babylon and then Persia before they were finally brought back to the land here in the book of Ezra. This is a fantastic thing because uh, and we read in Ephesians that he is abundantly able to do all that we hope and ask for, and, and even more. And here Habakkuk says, listen, just remember some mercy. And, and God doesn't just remember mercy when punishing Judah. He has already planned out how he wants to restore them. The Old Testament story about, uh, the, the Old Testament narrative about Judah being taken in captivity is really about God's protection for them even as they sin. And even as they're far from him, God is still looking after them. Well, that's the first part of Habakkuk chapter 3, but uh, it, the, the second part of it we find uh, in verses 17 to 19. I know it says chapter 2 up there, sorry. Um, but Habakkuk states that no matter what what is going on, going on, he has chosen to trust in the Lord. What's neat about the, the ending of Habakkuk um, is, is that Habakkuk goes through all these questions. Where are you, God? Why are you doing these things? You can't use the Babylonians. You're bringing destruction on Judah. Oh, my goodness. Is When we get to the, the end of chapter 3, um, and, and listen to what this says. He says, though the fig tree does not bud, I'm in verse 17, and there's no grapes on the vine, and though the olive crops fail and the fields produce fr no fruit, and there's no sheep in the pen or no cattle in the stall. In other words, what, what Habakkuk is, is explaining, he says, listen, even if all the crops fail and all the animals pass away and I have nothing, what am I going to do? Well, verse 18 says this, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Basically, what Habakkuk says here in these last couple verses of Habakkuk, he says, even if everything fails, I'm going to choose to trust in you. And this is very interesting because Habakkuk ends very similarly to the book of Job. Job quite literally loses everything. That by the time uh, Job and God speak to one another, Job has lost all the, all the food in the field. He has lost all, uh, all the animals in, in his care. He's lost everything. And you get to the end of the book of Job. Job finally says, God, why are you doing all this? You owe me an explanation. And God doesn't really give Job an explanation. He says, basically, you know, since you're God and you know what that, what's going on, Job, you can instruct me. And Job, finally, God says, answer back to me, Job. Tell me, why is it that 
that you deserve an answer. And Job's response to God's response to him is very similar to what we see at the end of Habakkuk. Here in Job chapter 42, verses 2 and 3, Job says this, I know that you can do all things, and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things that I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. Habakkuk and Job literally come to the exact same place when they question God and God responds to them. God responds and they say, you know what, God? How about you be God and I'll just go back to being me? Job says, listen, I, I, I spoke of things that are above what I can understand. And even Habakkuk here, he says, listen, even if you take it all away, even if Babylon comes and it wipes everything out, I am going to put my trust in you because you're God and I'm not. And I think that's an excellent thing for us to understand as well. This idea of trusting in the Lord. Because let's be honest, none of us get all the answers in life. But the, but the ability to trust in God is, it is essential for us. And frankly, it, it is an ongoing, it was an ongoing idea, even in the Old Testament. Uh, Psalm 46.10 says this, He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. There's a real sense that Habakkuk probably should have known this already, that God was in control and that God was sovereign over the nations. Uh, like he, he had these scriptures in front of him. But still, it, it wasn't until Habakkuk came face to face with these questions that he realized that no matter what happens, I'm going to put my faith and trust in him. Well, for us, we may not be living in the time of Judah, but we're living in a world that has a lot of unanswered questions right now. And we can sit there and we can shake our fists and, and like Habakkuk did, demand answers from God. Um, maybe you'll get answers from God, maybe you won't. But ultimately, it didn't matter what the answer was, Habakkuk and Job decided to put their faith and trust in God, even if the answers in this life did not completely make sense. And believe it or not, that's exactly what Jesus asks us to do. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, Jesus says this, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, about what you'll eat or drink, about, what, about your body and what you'll wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? He would go on later to say that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all those things will be added to you. Do I have all the answers to what's going on? No, I don't. And I'm probably fair to say that you don't have the answers either. But ultimately, the message of Habakkuk, the message of Job, and the message of the New Testament is we are blessed to be loved by the one who does have the answers. The one who does have all these things under control. The one who is there and loves us through it all. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our time in the book of Habakkuk. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna be starting a, a new book uh, in the next week or two. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what we're gonna start next, uh, but if you have a suggestion, feel free to shoot me a, shoot me a text or an email. Uh, I'd I'd love to get some of your feedback and uh, see what you've enjoyed about these studies and. Uh, see if there's an area in God's Word that we can go next. I just want to remind you, as always, um, the this study, the study we did in in First Peter and Titus, all these are on the website. Uh, our weekly uh, our weekly message from God's Word as we're wrapping up the Book of Matthew is already there is also there. I encourage you to to follow along with those as well and continue to grow in your knowledge and your trust of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Have a good week.